Hey everybody, welcome back to another week of Yolitics. Jason and Jason here once again. Uh, we're uh, virtual again this time. Uh, after we we've been together the past couple of weeks, what 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 did you end, Jason? Was it too much? Uh, you're, person time. you're allowed to take, Wheeler. I mean, people don't realize that. I mean, you, you know, you come across as, you know, good-looking guy, square-jawed, you know, nice all-American dude. Wow, please go on. I mean, just... We've got all the know. time in the world on this podcast if you'd like to continue that thought. After a while. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're, we're taking a, a, a sort of distance break this week, uh, but we're joining each other on the computer. Uh, what... Uh, what, what do you have in today? Well, we're, we're taking a distance break because we, we couldn't get on the road and uh, and go down to Austin to interview our guests today. And events um, dictated that we had to uh, ha- do an Austin-based podcast this time because it's true. a really interesting case. But because of that, I am having a uh, Central Texas beer. I'm oh, nice. I'm having a, uh, a Hans Pilsner. Oh, This is from nice. Real Ale Brewing Company. In uh, Blanco, Texas, right? Is it Blanco? Blanco. That's how they say it. It's supposed to be Blanco, but you know, it's. I'm Texas. glad I had that one right. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Was, I was a little nervous about that. Uh, yeah, this this I've never had. I don't think I've had this this Pilsner, but it's I, I like Pilsners. Okay, uh, so you chose yours uh, based upon uh, where it's made, wow. and yeah. you just already took a sip there. I haven't even opened mine yet. How is it, by the way? fantastic it's a pill oh, good it's thanks for waiting uh <laughs> i i chose a, a fort worth beer i didn't choose it for where it's made this is uh, from martin house uh brewing company uh i chose the pretzel stout limited release white chocolate which sounds just milky and muddy and crazy and Ugh. i think and that's why i chose it because i think that fits what we're talking about today because we're sort of in some uncharted territory here texas wise this is a it's a wild podcast about a wild idea uh that's that's taking place here i'm gonna venmo you a 100 bucks right now if you shoot that beer i I already have your venmo up right now your your venmo's up right here i'm I'm going to send it over not worth it not worth it i I would never do that with a stout it's a pretzel stout, Especially white a chocolate. white chocolate pretzel stout. No. Go ahead and gonna, tap it open. Let's see what it tastes like. Oh, that is uh, definitely stout and very chocolatey. <laughs> very sweet. Puckery sweet. Woo! Yeah. Right, I'll oh. stick to my Hans Build it on my here. computer. All right. Uh, well, so- we're, 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 yeah, we're talking about a case that, that made a lot of news at the time. This happened back in July of 2020. I remember it. Do you remember this case? It it, it made national news at the time. It was uh, a Black Lives Matter protest, and uh, it happened in the city of Austin. Mm -hmm. There was a shooting, and a Black Lives Matter protester was shot and killed by an Uber driver. Mm -hmm. And this Uber driver is a former Army veteran. That doesn't really matter in here. The, the, The point is, he was an Uber driver. He was arrested and charged with murder. And most recently, just... What last week, uh, week before last, he was convicted. This mm-hmm. guy was convicted. His name is Daniel Perry. He's the guy who uh, opened fire on this Black Lives Matter protester. Now, there's a lot of little uh, little things about this too. And and Wheeler, I think you're familiar with the case. But the Black Lives Matter protester apparently was offended, concerned, worried that this. Daniel Perry was this Uber driver was driving into the protest. Mm-hmm. And so the victim in this case walks over. The victim in this case has an AK-47. The victim in this case and is which he's open to carrying, which he's allowed to do in Texas. Perfectly fine. Per- yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? Come on, it's Texas. You can walk around with an AR-15 yeah. anywhere you want on a public property. They mm-hmm. do it at the state capitol all the time. Just anybody can. I thought I saw you one Thursday down there too, but I, I, the back of the guy's hair was a little different, so I don't think it was you. It's my evil twin. Um, so, uh, so yes, this protester is walking around with this AK-47. Right. Uh, he's worried about this driver coming toward the crowd. The driver also, you know, is legally armed uh, sure. inside that car. Uh, there's disagreement there. That the, you know, the defendant here, Daniel Perry, uh, the the U.S. Army sergeant from uh, Fort Hood. Um, uh, you know, basically saying that, hey, you know, I uh, was worried. I was scared for myself because his weapon pointed at me. Witnesses said, nah, that's not, you know, quite the way this went down. There was a lot made about this Uber driver and some of his past uh, past statements that were attributed to him and social media posts and text and what his frame of mind really may have been. Uh, 
the, the fact of the matter is, is uh, and, and, and so in the end, he shoots and kills the protester there uh, on the street. Uh, a lot has been made about this. You know, people you know, may remember the case from when it first happened in, in the summer of 2020 after uh, George Floyd uh, died at the hands of police in Minneapolis. And these were the Black Lives Matter protests that erupted afterwards. So I, I think a lot of people are familiar with it from then. But then they sort of lost track of this and didn't pay any attention to this trial. Uh, and the jury came to a verdict uh, uh, you know, earlier this week and said, yeah, uh, Daniel Perry uh, committed murder there. Uh, again, most people still didn't tune into it until less than 24 hours after that verdict was read, the governor of Texas, in a very unusual step, this is a a sort of uh, unprecedented, uncharted, this is where we get into that uncharted portion of this. The governor stepped in and said publicly, hey, um, I would be totally open, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, to uh, issuing a pardon for this defendant. Uh, and, and I can't just do that on my own, but I'm going to ask the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to go ahead and expedite review of this case so that it can hit my desk and I can give a pardon here. Now, let's give our listeners some context here on this as well. The governor said this. Governor Abbott said this. I want to read his tweet. The governor tweeted out, Texas has one of the strongest stand your ground laws of self-defense that cannot, he said, be nullified by a jury or a progressive district attorney. I will work as swiftly as Texas law allows, the governor said, regarding the pardon of Sergeant Perry. Now, the governor tweets this out, but here's what's interesting about it. It comes uh, almost immediately after calls uh, for him to do this from the right, from people like Tucker Carlson, who you know is urging the governor of Texas to pardon this guy. From people like Kyle Rittenhouse. Remember Kyle Rittenhouse? He's the, the young man from Wisconsin who shot two protesters. I think killed at least one of them. And he uh, was uh, he was acquitted, I believe, by the jury up there. But the governor's facing calls from the right to do this. The governor, whether he gives in or not, or whether he already had this in his mind to do, the governor decides he's going to do this. And that is why this has made so much national news right now. Yeah, so we reached out to uh, some folks who are very well versed uh, in in the law here in Texas uh, to to just sort of talk about a you know how significant is this? How unusual is this? How much should we all be paying attention to this? And and what does this lead to down the road? So we talked to two of them in Austin, and we should have gotten in the car and gone down there. It was kind of a last minute thing, so we didn't do that. You didn't want to be with me. I, you're, I was going to take the Greyhound down, but um, <laughs> I, I've ridden with you. You're, you're, you're frightening to ride with. Oh, jeez. You know, your second, your, your second career instead of real estate, it could be NASCAR. Well, Just keep that it, in the it back does of your mind. sound exciting. Yeah. Keep it in the back of your mind. Our first guest up right now is Jennifer Lauren. She is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Professor uh, Lauren, thank you so much for for being with us uh, here today to talk about this. I know you've been watching this case closely. Uh, so many people in, especially in Travis County and Austin, have been watching this. I don't know that you know people across the state have been keeping up with it as much. I'd like to just start off by getting your top line reaction to what has happened here with the governor of Texas stepping in immediately after this verdict was read uh, by the jury and saying that he would happily uh, approve a pardon in this case. It's, it's pretty unusual. I think that the thing that struck me most actually about the announcement from the governor was, was not so much the, the fact of the request that the Board of Pardon and Paroles review the case, but rather the reasons that were stated for it. What was striking to me was that the request was sort of justified in terms that made the uh, the prosecution itself and the jury's verdict sound sort of illegitimate or without basis in the law, right? The, the request was premised on the breadth of Texas's self-defense law and the notion that individuals have a right of self-defense without retreat under that law. And that based on that, neither the prosecution itself nor the outcome could possibly be justified in law. Um, and from my standpoint, you know, with, with knowledge of the Texas Penal Code's provisions on self-defense, that's just wrong uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a legal matter, as a, as a sort of um, a matter of what the issues were that were at stake at the trial. 
So, Professor, our mutual friend uh, there that you work with, Stephen Vladek, says that he he recommended you because you have real Texas criminal law chops. Uh, <laughs> that's what he told us. Uh, but hey, I'm, I'm curious, um, what's been the reaction in legal circles? What, what are attorneys talking about uh, and, and legal experts when it comes to this case? There's been, and, and, I, and I share this concern, uh, a concern about the degree to which this announcement coming directly on the heels of the jury verdict is sort of um, a, a, a slap in the face to the jury process itself, right? Um, we speak of, in our legal system, and criminal legal system in particular, the jury as kind of the gold standard for uh, determining uh, truth uh, in our um, legal system. And to sort of, uh, in the immediate aftermath of that trial process and jury deliberations, to sort of allege that it's all um, you know, wrong, wrong and illegitimate to a certain degree without having examined the evidence or the record yeah. at trial um, has struck many, including myself, as, you know, a, a potential kind of jab really at, at the jury system and at the jurors themselves. Well, let's talk a little bit about, and you know, without getting too far into the legalese of this, I think that most people understand, you know, in general terms, what stand your ground means here in Texas. This trial really put a spotlight on stand your ground. Do you have the right to self-defense in certain situations? If somebody, you know, comes into my home uh, and I shoot them uh, because they broke into my home, then, you know, I think most people would find that I'm well within my rights uh, under stand your ground. This was a different scenario where where this uh, particular defendant drove into a group of uh, Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, and then, you know, we have a, a standoff with, you know, one of the, the protesters out there who is armed. We have the driver who's armed. The driver shoots the protester to death there. Um, you have talked a little bit about this and about how uh, there is a real complicating factor when you go into the situation where there is a conflict, you, where, where you actively take yourself into a, a, a situation where you're, you may have that stalemate. An individual does not have the right to use deadly force in response to an immediate threat of deadly force being used against them if that person has provoked the force coming at them. Provoked is the, is the language in the statute. And generally speaking, although the statute doesn't define provocation, courts have talked about this as an idea of an individual whose conduct is reasonably calculated to produce a response and is deliberately done in order to be able to use force against the responder. And so uh, a, a, a factual and then legal question that was absolutely posed and, 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 and litigated at trial was what was the conduct and intention of the defendant when he drove in, onto the street on which the protests were happening? Right? The state's contention, and they offered evidence to support this, was that the defendant did that having wanted to, having contemplated wanting to have an opportunity to use deadly force against the protesters. The defendant's contention was, that's not at all what happened, right? I drove onto the street by mistake. I encountered the protesters by accident. It was never in my mind when I turned my car toward those protesters to elicit a response that would allow me to use my weapon. Um, but that was that was squarely before the jury, right? Those competing contentions were before the jury and the jury. And would, the associated evidence, too. That's right. Right. The evidence and the argument and the law, the jury would have been instructed that essentially if the state had proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had provoked the victim's use of force, that self-defense was not an appropriate sort of justification to be, um, to be found. 
Professor, my last question for you is Governor Abbott obviously pledging to, to pardon the defendant in this case. Do, do you think that the governor would have as much interest in this case if roles were reversed, if a Black Lives Matter protester shot and killed an Army veteran? I mean, I want to be cautious here. We can all only speculate, right? Um, and I want to stay in my lane. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a politician. However, um, given sort of where I think we all have seen that the governor finds kind of political fodder, right? It's hard to imagine that if the roles were reversed, this would be a politically advantageous move for him. Hmm. Um, I have one more for you too here. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people perhaps outside of Austin or Travis County may not have even paid a lot of attention to this trial, may not have even known it was taking place or kept up with it in any way. I think it was the governor's actions here stepping in and saying that he would happily pardon this defendant right away. Uh, I think that's probably what drew most people's attention to this. And yet, you know, there'll be a lot of people who go, oh, okay, and see that headline and then go back to sleep on this. How how closely should people watch this or be concerned with this or 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 think about what is happening with this case? I mean, what do we do about the fact that we have Republican legislatures and Republican governors who are in deep, deep disagreement with locally elected Democratic district attorneys who have come into office uh, with particular priorities in terms of prosecution. That's not a new phenomenon, right? It's not at all a new phenomenon that individual district attorneys prioritize prosecution or deprioritize prosecution of cases in particular ways. But it's that phenomenon has now become so deeply, deeply politicized and polarized um, such that, you know, individual prosecutions that, as you say, would not see, you know, national light at all can quite plausibly become a kind of red meat political issue, right? Um, and that as a, as a general matter, that, that sort of broader <clears throat> politicization of the criminal legal system is a matter of 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 concern and should be a matter of concern for all of us professor lauren thank you so much for the time we appreciate it yeah you're welcome this was fun okay so that's the view uh from the classroom uh right now uh, interesting that you know this is something that it could almost it's almost like it straddles two things here uh jason uh, regardless of how this plays out, it sounds like, you know, definitely it's something that legal or law students would would study there. Uh, but also, it, it almost sounds like it would fit into a government course as well. Uh, it's just it's a novel case in that we saw the governor step in so early and so aggressively uh, right after a jury verdict had been read and before the sentencing has even happened. And people aren't just talking about this on the Twitterverse or talking about this in the courthouses, mm -hmm. wondering how this is going to unfold, what's going to happen and whether it sets any precedent as well. Our next guest also in Austin is a uh, former judge. He's a former uh, state district judge. He is now a senior district judge. His name is David Wahlberg. This, this is a case that you could spend an entire law school class, a semester worth of class talking about. I, I was just about to welcome you in, uh, Judge Wahlberg, but I, I think that's a fascinating point. And let's start there. Uh, you have been in this a long time. You were in practice. You okay. became you were in practice for 35 years. Uh, you became a judge. Yes. Uh, you're now a senior judge. Uh, and and I'm curious where this case stands in all of the cases that you have seen over these years. Well, it's a highly unusual case in a lot of respects. Um, first of all, it's not uncommon for self-defense to be raised as an issue in murder trials, um, but it is uncommon to um, have a lot of the incident on video, and it's uncommon to have an issue of um, provoking the difficulty raised. So that makes this a, a highly unusual 
um, sort of case. And then you add in the governor's um, actions and that really complicates things. So. What was your reaction to what the governor said? Because we've all watched this governor, even when he was attorney general, but as governor, he hasn't granted clemency. He hasn't pardoned many people. And for him to come out and say he would pardon this defendant who was convicted by a jury and, you know, Abbott and, and the GOP for years said they're the party of law and order. And here we have a case go through law and order, go through the court system, and the governor says this. What was your reaction to what the governor said? Well, I, I think it clearly demonstrates that the conservatives have, by and large, abandoned uh, the idea that they support law and order. I mean, we're seeing that across the country in a variety of different venues. Uh, but my response in particular to Abbott's comment was that it's simply outrageous um, for one individual who has not heard a word of testimony uh, to try to substitute their judgment for that of, of 12 jurors who spent eight days listening to 40 witnesses and then deliberated for a significant period of time before reaching a verdict. Actually, it turns out it's maybe 13 jurors who agreed unanimously because one of the alternates was uh, quoted recently in the paper as saying um, he agreed with the verdict. And judge, it seems like, too, though, that, that whether Abbott is bowing to political pressure on the right, he can still do this. He certainly has the power to do it. Um, I think that it's unwarranted. I believe that it is unprecedented in Texas history, at least since we um, since the legislature revamped the um, pardon and parole laws after Ma Ferguson, you know, whatever that was, 90 years ago was suspected of selling pardons, the legislature changed uh, the rules. And as far as I know, um, there's been no similar pardon um, in the intervening, whatever it is, 80 or 90 years. Uh, Judge, let's take this a, a step further, if we could. Uh, you know, we've heard your reaction about what the governor has done as far as stepping into this. Um, does it add significance to it, though, that A, this came less than 24 hours after the verdict was announced, before this defendant was even sentenced, and it came after the governor was lobbied actively on uh, conservative uh, cable news channels uh, by the Republican Party chairman in the state of Texas. Does that, you know, I guess in a in legal terms or in in courtroom terms, does that add a sort of aggravating factor to it that we have these uh, clearly, uh, you know, political figures asking the governor to intervene, and immediately he does in a criminal court case that has just been decided by a jury? Absolutely, um, I think that that four years of Trump presidency. Um, pretty much illustrated the um, problems that come along with having um, talking heads dictate our public policy. Um, and I think that in, in this case, the idea that the governor is responding to pressure from cable news um, and from other conservative voices who likewise have no knowledge of the actual facts, just demonstrates that it's a purely political um, bit of pandering to the base. And Judge, uh, talk about the precedents this will set if, if the governor goes through with it. Well, obviously, if, if the governor goes through with this, that opens the door for him to do similar things in the future or for any other future governor to uh, step in where he dislikes the verdict or where his party dislikes the verdict. I mean, I, I can't imagine what the reaction would be if, for instance, the Supreme Court decided a case based on news reports rather than on the actual record of the case. I mean, that would be outrageous to everybody. And I think we ought to all be outraged at, at the governor's actions here.
As someone who's been around in in the legal system for for quite a while too, uh, you you can you know put together trends over time as well uh, that you know one case can affect how people think about a particular issue, uh, and you might see additional cases pop up because of that. I'm curious if you think that this could also expand or encourage uh, you know more people to uh, you know sort of test where is the 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 border with stand your ground? How far can I go? Uh, you know what can I get away with? Is there a concern about that? I think there is, and there should be. Um, I think that to the extent that the governor is encouraging people to shoot other people, um, that's, that's a really dangerous precedent. Mm. Um, you know, by saying that Texas has uh, the strongest stand your ground law in the country, what we encourage is for people to try to take advantage of that. Um, and the law in Texas is, is truthfully pretty strong on the defendant's uh, part when, when self-defense is an issue, because it requires the government to disprove self-defense, and it requires the jury to view the facts from the defendant's perspective. So it's a, it's a high burden um, for the state to um, overcome. Now, and the other part of this that I think we ought to all be concerned about is the effect on prospective jurors. I mean, if jurors know that that some elected official is going to second guess their decisions without any knowledge of the facts, without having heard a word of the evidence, that is going to discourage people from coming in um, and serving as as jurors. Hmm. But um, you, you have to show up, though. How would how could how could I get out of that with the governor's actions? I think though? it'll just encourage people not to show up at all, hmm. which is, just, I mean, this is a problem in our system is we, we sure. typically um, summon X number of people and 60% of them show up. Um, and so I think that, that if, if the public becomes concerned that their service as a juror is worthless, then they're more likely to simply not show up or have some excuse for not serving. Uh, since we're talking about the effects that this has on different aspects of the legal system too, Judge, I'd like to know, uh, you know, your best guess, uh, what this does to district attorneys around this state. As it is, the governor has uh, been pretty vocal about wanting to rein in uh, district attorneys, especially in uh, urban areas where he feels like they're too liberal uh, in, in what they pursue and don't pursue. Uh, does this stiffen the resolve of district attorneys around the state to, to be as independent as possible? Or is there a chilling effect that can go in uh, when you see a governor stepping into a case like this uh, less than 24 hours after it's been decided by a jury? I think it cuts both ways, actually. I think that some prosecutors uh, will buck up and say, I'm going to do what I believe is right, uh, regardless of, of the political consequences. I think that a lot of prosecutors are, you know, they're all elected officials and they're going to have to be looking at their next election two or four years down the road. And so there is um, a real pressure there um, to conform mm. um, because obviously the governor has got a, a tremendous amount of power. And if he steps in and, and um, you know, endorses someone's opponent or something like that, that could be pretty potent. Judge, we've heard a lot of uh, people on the right say, the weaponization of the justice system when talking about Donald Trump's indictment in New York City by the DA there, Alvin Bragg. Alvin Bragg legally could do what he did, present a case to the grand jury there. The governor in this case in Texas can legally do what he's doing here. Is this too weaponization of the justice system or politiz politicization of the justice system maybe? I think it is clearly political, but I think what I would hope for here is that we all sort of take a deep breath and let the process work. I mean, like you've said, the governor is calling for a pardon less than 24 hours after uh, the defendant was found guilty. We still haven't gotten through sentencing, which is a big consideration. The, I believe that the defense has already filed 
a motion for a new trial. Mm -hmm. So we need to get through the judge's ruling on that um, and any additional motions that they may have um, here in the future. Uh, and then the full appellate process ought to play out before um, a decision is made whether or not to pardon. But is that going to happen? I mean, realistically, you, you, you've you practiced law here. You, you know what the politics of this state are. I'm hopeful that if this case sits for a little bit and cools off, um, that the governor will realize that he ought to let the process work, um, that he did take that oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the state. And if you're really a law and order supporter, you ought to support the judiciary mm -hmm. um, and you ought to support the process. So I'm hopeful that there's a way that the governor can find to gracefully back down here until um, at least the appellate uh, work is completed. Uh, of course, you know, what we've been able to understand from from the news reports on this, though, is that the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles has already begun the process. So the wheels are turning here. The governor rightly pointed out, though, when he said that he would, you know, essentially love to grant a, a pardon in this case, he rightly pointed out that he doesn't have the unilateral authority to do that. He has to wait for the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to say, yeah, you can do that or, or, or to get that recommendation from them. All it takes is a majority vote. It's a seven member board. Here's the thing, though, that board, you know, Governor Abbott's been around for a while. So that's that board has been appointed by him. Uh, these are people who are not uh, accountable to the public, to voters. Uh, essentially, they're accountable to, you know, the, the man who uh, appointed them. Um, how confident are you in in that process? Because it's already odd uh, that they would take up a case so early on. I'm concerned. Uh, I, I think that there's obvious um, pressure there from the governor um, to persuade the board to, to recommend a pardon. Normally, the board would want to take a detailed look at um, all of the facts before making a recommendation. Um, and in a case like this, what they ought to do is at least read the transcript of the trial. I mean, there are 40 witnesses involved here. And you would hope that they would make an informed decision rather than just um, respond to pressure from the governor. Well, now, to that point, though, the district... Of, oh, go ahead. Realistically, they're all appointees of the governor. They serve at his pleasure. Well, that's not right. They're appointed for set terms, but he's appointed all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that realistically... There's a pretty high likelihood that, that uh, the board is going to recommend a pardon pretty promptly. Judge, there are people who are also cheering on the governor here um, and who th think he's doing absolutely the right thing. They are convinced uh, that this uh, defendant uh, got a raw deal and that he should go free. Um, what do you say to people out there who say, this is the process, the way it's supposed to work. He's he's doing, you know, what he's allowed to do, and 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 this is all fine with me. What do you what do you say to people who say that about the precedent that's being set here? Well, I mean, I, what I generally say to people is that that reasonable folks can disagree about what the facts prove, uh, and that's that's why we have juries, um, because you know the truth is that ninety maybe 95% of all of our criminal cases are resolved through plea bargaining. And so, we, but we need juries to come in and make decisions where reasonable people can't come to an agreement. So our system is based on the idea that reasonable people can disagree, but we need some third party set of independent eyes to look at the evidence and, and give us a judgment. I think that, that that's um, the way the system ought to be designed and, and ought to work. In this particular case, I mean, I understand people just based on the idea that some army sergeant shot some Black Lives Matter protester. And that's a whole sort of other whiff of, of problems there. Um, but I certainly understand that some people have an emotional reaction just to that um, short synopsis of what happened. 
but in order to make a good decision, you really need to have all the facts in front of you. It's Judge, like, I would argue that the right has the, the the political right is reacting solely to that line you just said. An a former army sergeant shot and killed a Black Lives Matter protester. If it were the opposite, I, I can't imagine the governor stepping in on that. I agree. You know, if that had been a pro-choice protester rather than a Black Lives Matter protester, we wouldn't be here. Hmm. I'm sorry to say it, but but that's that's the way it looks. Judge, my last question for you is, um, you know, you're a Democrat, uh, but you've been around a long time and and you've uh, no doubt have a huge network uh, of people that you talk to, Republican, Democrat, and in between. Uh, and I'm just curious, uh, you've been vocal about this case since the governor uh, decided to step in. Um, what have you been hearing in in the legal community you know and and it, it'd be great if you can kind of typify what you've heard across the spectrum um you know from your friends politically i've heard from both sides frankly although i'm a lifelong democrat and previously a criminal defense lawyer a lot of my friends are republicans it's texas you know, a lot of my friends are conservative Republicans, and that's fine. We can disagree about a lot of things. And so some of them just jump right in and say, it's self-defense. He's not guilty. Let's go on down the road. And when I start talking to people about the importance of knowing the facts, um, rather than making just a, a snap judgment, everybody then starts to slow down. If you say, let's let the process work like it's designed to work and see what the result is. That, that generally carries a lot of weight um, on both sides. So I'm, I mean, I'm a Democrat, but truthfully, um, I think I got my first firearm when I was nine years old. Um, I've got 30 or 40. Um, and, I, and I understand that, that, you know, Second Amendment fervor. This is a, a, an example of what happens when the Second Amendment um, doesn't require good judgment um, because what we saw here based on the reports is poor judgment on the part of both individuals. Judge Wahlberg, we appreciate the time. Thanks for the insight as well. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Judge. Call, call me anytime, but I hope this is, uh, frankly, I don't think this case is going to be over for a good while. Hmm. So. Yeah. We'll see what happens. So, Wheeler, the, the judge said something there. I don't know if you heard. He explained how Texas Democrats are not the same as Democrats in other states. Yeah. He has it's a different 30, breed. He has 30 to 40 firearms. Find me another Democrat in, in other states that have that many. I'm sure people will be sending me ads on Twitter and sending me emails. I have X number of firearms. I'm a Democrat. 30 to 40 firearms. I mean, that, that's a Texas Democrat. That's a an yeah. Ann Richards Democrat right there. And he's got a lot of Republican friends, too, he, yeah. he noted. Uh, it is Texas. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, we're still waiting for sentencing in this right. case. Uh, again, the, um, the man who's been convicted here uh, has also uh, asked for a, a new trial. Um, but yet, you know, we have this second track where this is already proceeding uh, under the review of the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to see if maybe uh, this will be sent over to the governor with a recommendation that he, um, you know, provide clemency uh, for this convicted killer at this point. I, I'm curious, though, Jason, um, as, as to how all this is going to play out, just because you know, we mentioned up top that there was a lot of pressure applied in the immediate aftermath of this verdict being read. Uh, there was a lot of pressure applied from conservative media, from the uh, leader of the state Republican Party here in Texas. Uh, and Governor Abbott did come out with this strongly worded statement saying that he would love to, uh, you know, provide a pardon in this case. But he did mention that, you know, but first I've got to wait for this board of pardons and paroles. And I, I, I do wonder here, you know, do they do they, quote unquote, see things his way pretty quickly here because he appointed all of them? Or do they go through this with a fine tooth comb and say, gosh, no, sorry, the evidence, the testimony here, the facts just say that we absolutely can't do this. 
And that gives the governor a fig leaf to sort of, you know, cover himself here with and go, hey, I had to play by the rules here. I had to put it to this, this board, and the board is the one saying that I can't do this. I would love to do this, but I can't do this. So either way, politically, the governor sort of scores a win there. Uh, if he's able to do the, the, the pardon, he, he you know, scores one with the base. If he's not able to do the pardon, it's because the board acted in a certain way and, and tied his hands. Yeah, politically, that would be a good out if he's if he's looking for a, a way to, you know, to avoid doing this. I can imagine he is, though. The other thing I'm watching for, too, is to see what else the governor actually says about this. Mm-hmm. Um, it, like I mentioned to the to the uh, judge there, I, I have been and you probably have too at countless rallies for different Republican candidates for the mm-hmm. past 25 years in this state alone. And they talk about law and order constantly. Now, this is, again, as as Professor Lauren pointed out, the governor has the authority to grant someone clemency, to pardon someone. But I I would like to hear him explain a little more about it and see if he can distance himself from the folks on the right who are calling for this. Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this isn't just any governor either. Uh, You know, we've had uh, governors with various backgrounds in this state. This is a governor who served as attorney general in this state and as a state Supreme Court justice in this state. So uh, this is a governor who very well knows the law and the practice of law uh, and the application of law. And uh, again, uh, it it is an an unusual step what he has uh, decided to do here. It will be very interesting to see going forward, A, what happens with this case, and B, how the governor responds to some of the questions that have come about because of what he has uh, initiated here. He, he knows the law, no doubt, and he also knows politics, no doubt. We have seen him conform to fit to what the right wants ever since COVID and perhaps even before. So he knows the law, he knows politics, and he's going to, to, to play them both to his advantage. Why wouldn't he? He, he, he's in charge. He won a third term. Why wouldn't he want to do this? Mm-hmm. But for everyone else on the sidelines looking at, at, at whether the GOP is a party of law and order, like they have said for so many years, and to see what's happening on the side is very interesting. And I do think you still have to draw a parallel to what Republicans have been saying about the New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg. They have the, the one line they, they've taken from the Trump campaign is the weaponization of the legal system. Right. This is the politicization of the legal system. And, and you know, uh, Democrats, we're Democrats. They're, they're not talking about that at all. We haven't heard any type of messaging from the left about that. It, it, it kind of goes to show where, where today's Democratic Party is on messaging. They're, they're a failure at it. But that that's going to be, like you said, interesting to see. I hate ending a podcast with something's interesting to watch, but that that will be something fascinating to watch this unfold. And we are still in that stage with this one, though. We are going to have to watch to see how this plays out, not only in the justice system, but also politically. Uh, and it could have ramifications in both of those arenas, which, again, goes back to that whole thing about, you know, this could all be taught someday in not only right. the law classes, but also in the government classes. Did you finish that beer? I did not. Uh, I am two sips in, and um, I feel like I'm having a sugar high. I'll raise it to 250 I'll Venmo you 250 bucks right now if you shoot that. <laughs> you keep sweetening that Just pot like that, and you'll it, talk man. me into this. <laughs> hey, guys, thanks so much for listening to Yellowtix. We always appreciate it. We, we do welcome your feedback on this. Do you think yeah. the, uh, the governor's in the right? Do you think that people who are questioning the governor's authority, his legal authority— do you think that they are in the wrong for even questioning that? You can find us uh, at Jason Wheeler TV on Twitter, or you can find me at Jason Whiteley. We get each other's email all the time as well. So uh, reach out however you can. And, and, and as always, really, we appreciate you listening.